Cadê? A galinha fugiu. Ô, oh, rapaz, você aí, meu irmão. Pega a galinha, segura a galinha aí, rapaz. Não, tem que arriscar, cara. Hum, vai. Ó, tu tá arriscando tua vida, tô por causa de foda, hein. Sai dessa. Pô, cara, tu acha realmente que eu gosto de ficar cara a cara com aquele bandido filho da puta? Pega a galinha aí, rapaz! Pega! Ô, bora, meu irmão, segura a galinha, rapaz! Ô, filha da puta, eu não mandei você segurar a galinha, rapaz! Que arrombado! Fotografia podia mudar minha vida, mas na cidade de Deus, se correr o bicho pega e se ficar o bicho come. E sempre foi assim, desde que eu era criança. Questions? <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Jerry McCulloch. I'm the convener of the MA in Cinematography at Goldsmiths. Uh, we're delighted to have such a special guest this evening. Um, I also want to introduce you to Laura. Laura's the person who made this event happen, and she's been liaising with César for many months now. Um, so thank you, Laura. <laughs> um, and let's give César another warm welcome to No, Goldsmiths. no, no, it's, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. okay. I, am, I am an image person. Sound doesn't affect me. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to begin with a, with a quick chat. Please feel free to ask questions at any point. After a while, we'll, we'll open the discussion up to the whole room and we've got some mics somewhere. So I'm going to launch in with my first question, Suzanne, Cesar, which is, were you born a cinematographer? <laughs> How? How did it happen? How did, how I, did you um, begin? Um, I, I, I come from a um, middle class um, uh, family in Uruguay. Um, and my parents wanted me to upgrade, so they put me in a bourgeois rich people school, uh, Christian Brothers of Ireland, where I learned my English. Wow, and um, as the flow, I, um, when I had to decide when you're very young, 16, 17, what way you're going to go afterwards, the flow was a lawyer, uh, agronomist, 
and you know all those traditional economists. And um, I had photography. I have a dis I had discovered photography with 15 years old, and I had it as a hobby. I could never think of being a way of living or something. So, um, so I, I entered veterinary school, and I started University of Veterinary, but it was the late 60s. Everybody was going crazy. You know you want a revolution, and we wanted a revolution, so we wanted to change the world. So I started believing and thinking that with photography, I could change the world. And I got very committed into that, and um, I quit the university, and I went to Brazil, hippie, backpack, hitchhike, sleeping in churches and all over the place, in plazas and stuff like that. And in one of the places, I met a group of young people, and one was studying cinema. Wow, studying cinema? I mean, you can study cinema? So I, you know, that sounded great. So he introduced me to the director of, the, of that film school, and the guy liked me, and for some reason he gave me a scholarship for a three months summer course. So I went back to Brazil, packed some stuff, and went and did this summer course. And, um, and I loved it, and I said, this is what I want to do. So I went back to Brazil, talked to my parents, and said, you know, I'm forgetting veterinary, forgetting everything. I'm going to live, move to Brazil and study cinema. So was that and this all, is the first all aspects of cinema, or did you? It was a film school. It was an actual film school that, at the at the moment, it was very rare because normally, you, at that time, 1970, you would have a communication schools that had like a specializing in cinema or something like that. But this one was a film school. They taught you film, and they used a uh, film school in São Paulo, and they used uh, technicians from an old uh, studio that had been brought up, like a, they tried to do a Hollywood in Sao Paulo, uh, Studios Veracruz, and they hired lots of technicians from all over the world, uh, English cinematographers that came and, and, and made a new generation of, of Brazilian filmmakers. And these guys were teaching in that school. So it was a very pretty school. And this is the first point that I would, would like to emphasize is, I believe very much in film school and in film teaching. And because of that, in the um, mid-80s, I was invited to be part of a film school that was going to be founded in Cuba. It was a, a mix uh, of Garcia Marquez, the Colombian writer, and Fidel Castro, very close friends. And they understood the importance of having a uh, Latin American film school that would um, teach um, filmmakers to do independent anti-establishment films or something like that. That was perfect for my line of thinking, very methodical in that. So, um, so I went to this film school and I was invited to go there for six months for the first and I fell in love so much with the project and the people and that I stayed until the first generation was uh, coming out, three and a half years. So, um, and I believe very much that uh, the film school energy is so important because I believe that from there start the projects, start the groups, start the energies that after, afterwards going to continue. Um, I see lots of the students that came out from Cuba working together, and the, the crews that were formed at that time to do the film schools, to do the film projects, are the crews that are afterwards continuing. There is a film that maybe has been around pretty good, a Venezuelan film called Pelo Malo. Maybe somebody saw it. If you didn't see it, it's great. It's by um, a, a Venezuelan director with her uh, uh, Peruvian partner, with her Colombian uh, sound technician. It's, they get together to do films right after they left the school. So I, I believe very much in, in what, what happens in, in film school. 
uh, and in the Cuban film school, was there anything particular about the way that film was taught that's different from elsewhere? Yes, Fidel Castro, he, um, he separated um, a kind of a farm school that was um, like 17 kilometer, kilometers from a small village and about 70 kilometers from Havana. So it was isolated. So it was what I would call a, concent a cultural concentration camp. It was 24 hours of film. And it was common that 2 o'clock in the morning, some, uh, the build you had the building where the students would live, and then you had the buildings where the teachers would live. And I was neighbor to Garcia Marquez, to Costa Gavras, to Lucas, to, you know, it was amazing, just going down the stairs to have breakfast and going down the stairs with George Lucas. Ooh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> After a week, my idols like Costa Gavras, a week, maybe not, 15 days, standing in the queue for the, for the corridor, come on, Costa Gavras, hurry up. <laughs> the myth has, you know. But um, so it was common that, like, Two o'clock in the morning, somebody would knock the door at my flat, and I would open, and there would be a kid standing with a script and a bottle of rum under his both arms, and say, "Can we talk?" <laughs> so it was <clears throat> it was 24 hours of film energy, watching films, interchanging. There was a swimming pool, and obviously the swimming pool was just for getting together and continue talking about films. So, so that was very particular about. And how structured was all of that? Was it kind of just free flowing, or, or was no? It no, we had we had uh, we we had discussed very deeply how to teach films. But as I said, it was a very new school, so everything had to be uh, discussed and established. And at the beginning, there was like a encounter in between the more conservative Stalinist line of thinking and the more progressive uh, new left wing. And basically what it was is the, the, the more conservative would, would be more academic and we would, we, me putting myself in the other group, we would insist in giving the kids the tools to start to do the mistakes so we could help them. Because there would be, you know, like there was a line that would say, no, no, we can only give them cameras after the second year. No, no, give them the camera the first year and let them do mistakes. Especially because we were working at the beginning with video cameras that was new, had come out, uh, uh, umatic, and it was a big revolution for us, you know, being, being able to register an image and see it at the same time. So it was a yeah. big revolution. So come on, let's give the kids the tools and, and we'll work on top of their mistakes. Yeah, a little band dramatic. Those were the days. <laughs> <laughs> and at what stage in your career did you go into teaching in Cuba? That was that was 1986. If you consider I graduated 75, it was 10 years afterwards. I graduated 74. Um, I when I graduated, and that is something. Also, I would like to mention, when I graduated, because this is something that I discovered afterwards, now you guys are potential filmmakers. The day you graduate, you are unemployed. And that's, and that's a point. And when I got to that stage of an unemployed filmmaker, I started getting in crisis. I don't know enough. It's not enough what I studied, and you know, I need to study more. So I invented myself that I should do a post-grade or some more academic. And I came to Europe for that. And I was on my way to the film school in Woods in Poland. Oh, yeah. When I met a Uruguayan producer, I was staying in places of people that had recommended me. And I stayed in this guy, and he was a producer, and he said, come on, you studied four years. You don't have to study more, you have to work. You have to watch films, read, and work. So he gave me a credential, he, he was very well, he gave me a credential for the Cannes Film Festival, and he said, go to Cannes, watch as many films as you can, write about them, think about them, and afterwards, 
do something, take pictures or whatever. At that time, mm. and that is a great, huge difference now, it was very difficult to practice what we had learned. Renting a camera was expensive, buying film was expensive, uh, developing film was, you know, everything was expensive. Mm -hmm. My first film that I did in, in film school, I like to tell this because it's funny, is um, we wanted to film. So um, I had a colleague in the, my grade that her father worked in the jockey club where the uh, races of, of the horse. And at that time, there was no video. In order to establish which horse had won, they had 16 millimeter cameras pointed toward the final line, um, filming the arrival of the horses. And if they had a doubt, they would rush. They had a little lab inside, inside the jockey club. They probably had it here everywhere because they had to. So they, uh, they would rush, develop the film, project it, and see which horse had, had won. So those cameras were used only on weekends. So my friend talked to her father, and also they had lab, and they had leftovers because they would put a full reel on the camera, and they would just you know, get the final. So they had like lots of leftovers. So they had <coughs> boxes of leftovers, cameras, mm -hmm. and those were free from wow. Monday to Friday. That's a completely, so, a completely new definition of the, of the term rushes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. So that's how we together did our first film for film school. But now today, you have everything in your hand. And, and amazing, I mean, uh, that is something that I also enjoy telling. I used to go to, on set with a huge bag with a $500 uh, incident light meter, a $750, $750 spot meter, a $1,000 Color, emit, uh, color meter, um, a compass, uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a beautiful American cinematographer manual book that would give me all the... I have all here now. <laughs> and even better, because I have tools like Sunseeker that would tell me exactly where the sun will come out on such a day in June, and I can tell production if the sun is going to be hitting here, you know. So um, it's yeah, changed. Times have changed. It's changed. So coming back to your point that our, graduate, our graduates will start being unemployed. Not now. Now they are great not, filmmakers, not all of them. But just to prepare them for that moment, after you went to Cannes, how did you go about becoming chosen for projects and how did you uh, get into the collaboration with Fernando Morales. After Khan, after Khan, there was there was. I had my last year in in Brazil of film school. I had gone into a production company that was doing commercials, and I was very lucky because I managed to work as an assistant cameraman with my two Brazilian idols. One that was the best op camera operator that you can imagine that did all Glauber Rocha's film, Nelson Pereira dos Santos, you know, the big popes. And the other one was not such a good camera, but was a painter, and he was one of the best lighting cameramen that you can imagine, Mario Carneiro. And I was assistant to both of them. And also they gave me some films to do myself, so I started doing little films, little commercials. So I had a little reel of commercials that I had done in that period, six months or something like that. So at that time, there was a law, I don't know if it still exists, in Sweden that they accepted uh, foreign students to work legally, not on the black market. So we rushed to, to Sweden, but because of the Film Cannes Festival, we were late. So the Polish and the Portuguese had taken all the dishwashing jobs. So me and my girlfriend, we were both, she was a filmmaker also more on the director side. We were looking for jobs. So suddenly we went to a park that had lots of restaurants. And it's a beautiful park, Gamla Stana, a little island in, in Stockholm. And there was a film crew. And I you know, hadn't been close to camera for some time, so I was kind of magnetic feeling, so I rushed close, and I started watching how the guy, guy was filming, 
started chatting with him. And he was very friendly. He said, no, you don't need to look for work for jobs uh, dishwashing because cinematographers also emigrate. Look for a job as a cinematographer. What do you mean? I'm not going to dishwash. I'm going to do a camera. And finally, I said I was a lucky guy. A couple of days afterwards, I was doing some uh, films in, in, in Sweden. So that gave me a chance to, to work. And uh, afterwards, I came to London. I came to London and I, <laughs> yeah, I came to London. I lived here for some time because then I wanted to be in the, the British people were, uh, European people were very, very solidary with the dictatorships in South America. So um, we had uh, groups of uh, people, British people doing uh, committees of solidarity and helping and denouncing the dictatorship. So I joined them and worked with them. And what I did at that time, because film was so difficult, I did slideshows. That was the way we used to do films. You would do pictures on slides, put a tape recorder, project them at the same time, and click, 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 and that was the films we were yeah, able to do. Yeah, slideshow. Slideshow, yeah. Do you have a, a favorite film that you've made? And do you have a favorite sequence from it? I'm just trying to slide in another clip of yours so that we can see more of your work. They, they always ask me that. And I, no, no, I, <laughs> no, I. OK, so shall, I, we, <laughs> shall we just choose one? Yeah, yeah, we like some of them. <laughs> This is, this is uh, one thing that I, that I like to emphasize is I actually, with the pot potential that the possible, I come, as I said, I, I started as a still photographer. And as a still photographer, I enjoyed mostly being alone in the lab, manipulating my, my pictures. My, my granny had given me um, a room on, on the basement where I bought uh, equipment for working on pictures. And because I felt a little bit shy of, you know, interfering with reality, I would click kind of hidden documentary and then I would go into the lab and work on that. And I, I enjoyed that very much. The fact is that when I graduated from film school, my uh, final project that I we didn't do films as project because it was so expensive. We had to do a thesis or something like that. And my thesis, is that word? Thesis? Yeah. yeah, thesis. And my thesis was the creative power of color correction. Because at that time, it was very limited what you could do with film. You could only, from your negative, you could only pass it to positive, correcting the intensity of light and the intensity of three colors. That's all. No contrast, no. Any, no saturation or anything was that. So, um, but even even like that, I thought that uh, that color correcting you could interfere and change the reality. So, because of that, I believe very much in how much you can create in post production, and I relied very much on that. And City of God is an example of that. I started working with the color corrector, with the colorist six months prior to filming. Uh, when I was called to do The Constant Gardener here in England, the producer called me on the phone and said, uh, Cesar, I am sending you uh, CVs of assistant cameramen. And I said, could you first send me uh, co uh, colorist CVs? And she said, what, what do you mean? You're just going to use the colorist after you filmed? I said, no, no. I, I, I start working with him prior to film because it's with him that I'm going to establish what emulsion I'm going to use, what, uh, even what camera I'm going to use. Because with him, I'm going to sit in the coloring suite and play and find the look of the film together with him. And that's what we did in City of God. Sergio Pasqualino, Serginho, that was our colorist, he is in the main credits and the beginning credits. It's not, there are not very film that do that. Uh, he started working with me from the very beginning. So that makes that I rely very much on post-production. And also, uh, because I realize how stressing it is for the actors and for the directors 
to be interfering very much on set, changing gels, changing, you know, messing around with a technique, I try to rehearse, prepare, and test as much as I can before. And uh, I used to do that before with still camera, where I would put the same negative that I would use on the film, and I took pictures of everything and played around with those pictures. Then afterwards, when digital cameras came, I, I had a little uh, mini DV camera, which I used to rehearse a lot, and I, now I do it with my cell phone. I visit location, and I take pictures, and take pictures, and take pictures, because I, I, I pass from the written world of the script to the imagery as soon as possible, relating with the image as soon as possible. So I visit locations, I, you know, I, I frequent as much as I can the places that we're going to film. So that takes me to that, well, the, the picture I'm is gone, yeah. <laughs> but, but, um, but yes, this, for example, was a visit that we did to uh, a prison that was supposedly, a production wanted to know if we could use this prison as a hospital afterwards. It was a feasibility trip. But I started taking pictures with my little flap, flip cell phone, one mega. And, and those pictures, I started playing them with them afterwards. And that is something else that I like to transmit very much is the obsession. You know, when you're into a subject, you want to be into it and you want to research as much as you can and you want to take as much as you can from it. So I was visiting that prison, but I was already thinking, how am I going to do this film about blind people? How am I going to talk about blindness? And I was relating to that. So, you know, taking those pictures and randomly, you know, click, 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 all over the place. What I call the shooting in any direction. Because you don't know where you're going. You have, you have a script written in black letters on white paper. How does that translate to, is it going to be black and white? Is it going to be 16 mil? Is it going to be a round frame? Is it going to, you know, how is it going to look? And you start relating to that playing and playing and, and letting yourself freely, you know, experiment because you don't have the pressure of the actors. You don't have, you're free. You know, you're in the hotel playing with the Photoshop or, or in the location just going around taking pictures. So to conclude, I say that today I would divide the way I work in 40% pre-production, 40% post-production, 20% film. When I film, I try to be as bureaucratic as I can, as simple as I can, in order to leave all the space to the relationship of the director with the actors and the script. Make sense? <laughs> okay, sounds like a good time so to go to that blindness. What we, that what we were seeing, those were rehearsal pictures of City of God. I was, you know, Fernando was taking the actors to the set and I was playing around with them and, and messing around with the color in Photoshop and that's what came out. That will help us afterwards decide <coughs> which way we're going. Those there, yeah. Okay, and then, then we'll open up questions to the room and maybe let's start with going further into your process mm -hmm. and, and testing in pre-production mm -hmm. yep. and et cetera, et cetera. I'm afraid it's going to be infected. Surprise me the filth from the street on that shoe. What time is it? One thirty.
afraid to open them. Afraid I'll go blind in my sleep. Um, I'm gonna take a walk. Up. Only the infected are permitted within these doors. Once inside, follow the corridor until you find the wards. All right, let's go. How many of you are there? We don't know. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe you could count off one by one and introduce yourselves. I'm number one. I'm a police officer. Okay. I'm uh, number two. I'm a taxi driver. Uh, number three, a pharmacist assistant. Four, I'm a hotel maid. A five, financial advisor. Okay. That's my wife. That's my wife. When I started researching into the film, um, I received the script, and um, I hadn't read the book, so I started seeing that the script was a little bit literal and a little bit too much dialogue, so I, I rushed to the bookstore and bought the book and I read them simultaneously. How this came and I saw that from the very beginning Jose Saramago had given us the clue in which direction the photography should go. He talked of the blindness as being in a sea of white of milk, in a sea of white. So that was so great. Let me start playing with white and see how how white relates and how how I can make the image disappear into white. And that was what I did for some period, playing with stills and Photoshop and, and playing with areas and, and doing this rehearsing with the white. And that's where playing with that suggested me which way the cinematography should go during production and, and the tools that I should use and, you know, one thing that I knew is that if I was going to burn out image, I had to have a pretty flat image. So I had to kind of frontal light it. Or top light it, but in order to have the whole, because it was difficult to get an image that had a high contrast with dark areas. If I burnt out it, the medium, the middle light would disappear before the dark areas would get white. So that's why I had to have kind of flat. And that I learned playing with the stills. So that is what I do preparing and, and playing around with the pictures. OK, shall we open up questions to the room? Anyone like to go? So we we'll bring a mic up. <coughs> Um, just, uh, I guess, looking at this, would you say that um, you've developed a certain cinematic style? That you're you, sorry, at? sorry, again? But would you say that you have developed a certain cinematic style, or do you look at, um, do you approach each project completely uh, from a new, uh, from a cinematic style? I, I, you know, a human being likes being original. You know, since kid, we, we, we want to be original. We want to call our mother's attention different from the other kids, what the other kids do. So I would, I would prefer feeling that I am being original and 
trying to approach every film in a different way. Obviously, I have developed some tools that I like and that I know how to work with, but um, I prefer, you know, getting the script and, for example, now at this moment I am post-production, post-producing a film that I did with Fernando Mereles for Netflix called The Pope, and that happens very much in the Sistine Chapel. So looking around, I said, I have to start with Michelangelo. So I started from Michelangelo and went into Michelangelo's paintings and life, and, and from there on I started finding where that would talk, parts where they, dis where they discuss flashbacks, for example, would be probably more towards the final judgment, and other parts would be uh, towards the, the ceiling where the genesis is. So, you know, you, you need somewhere to start from, and, and then you start, and so maybe some things here because of Michelangelo's way of lighting, I flat lit it, so here again, flat. But I, I prefer starting from scratch. Thank you. Welcome. Next question. Hi, hi Susan. Um, could you talk about... Could you lift your hand? Oh, Where there you, you go. Hi, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Could you <coughs> talk about your experience with working with professional actors versus working with non-actors, and I suppose specifically what you found when... Was there a difference in the way they coped with the camera being on them in close-ups or nearby? Yes, great. Um, when Fernando called me to do, I, I, my first film, when I left film school, were documentaries. I love documentaries. I, I would do documentaries all my life. I enjoyed very, very much. Because documentary surprises you. Fiction has the thing that you know what you're going to shoot. Documentaries, you're shooting this, but something good for the film happened in this, and you go there. So I enjoy the adrenaline of the documentary. But obviously I enjoy film. But when Fernando called me to do um, City of God, I had, I had done lots of documentaries. And Fernando told me how he was approaching the film, working with these actors, and so and so. And I saw a little bit of how he was preparing, and I said, Fernando, we have to shoot this film as if it was a documentary. Let the guys do what they're doing, and I'll go after them. And I'll think of a way of shooting it, lighting it, and the camera that helps this. So basically what I did is I lit almost 360 with practical lights and stuff like that, so you, would, you wouldn't, because my thesis was we cannot give these kids marks and rigid because we'll kill the spontaneity from them. So that's the way we, we worked. And I, when, when the, comp the production company approached me, what equipment, I said, well, I want to I use quite a lot of 16 millimeter camera that are lighter and have longer magazines so I can film more time, 10 minutes, uh, handheld to go after them as a documentary. And I want my assistant cameraman to be a very experienced documentary assistant cameraman that he can improvise without, uh, how do you call it, the la trena? With, yeah, tape trena, measure. Okay. Tape. With a tape measure, you know, going towards the act. No tape measure. Uh, you know, the actor is here. And, and if I do here, you have to know that this is 70 centimeters and be ready to go. I, I also heard the story that he was so good, you had to ask him to delay yeah. The focus. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and after a week or two, Lula Carvalho, he's a pretty well-known cinematographer now, um, he, he was so good that I did this kind of thing, and he arrived together with me. So I was watching the dailies, and they looked like it was rehearsed. It was taking that little thing, of that documentary. So I said, Lula, please, I know you're not going to like what I'm going to say, but please, can you delay a little bit? Can you be a little late? Or even look for the focus a little bit? <laughs> to give it this grit, you know, that the editor liked so much and put in the film. So, so no, just to finish. So, um, 
this way we developed this way of filming that was very particularly, very particular. We used to film, rehearse, and then film again. What do I mean is, we would be, I would light, we would bring the actors in, and would, we would let them make a pass of the whole sequence. And I would be in the middle with them, documenting what happened. And obviously what would happen is, at a certain moment I would get a piece of, uh, of the foot of a sound microphone, or a piece of cable that was coming, or, you know, but of a two and a half minute sequence you would have two minutes that were usable. So what we would do is, afterwards we would do pickups, we would rehearse, and then, okay, the microphone cannot be here, you're, you have to stand a little bit, so we would redo it, but that first shot had the spontaneity, the, the truth that was very much used in the film. So what happened? Fernando and me, we enjoyed this system so much that we brought it to professional actors. And it was funny, the first day we were shooting Constant Garner with Ray Fiennes, because of this way of 360 light, you would go into a set and there wouldn't be any lights or stands or tripods or foams or anything. And, um, and I was with my 16 millimeter camera ready in my hand. So Ray Fine walks into the set and he said, oops, sorry, they told me you were ready. And the assistant director said, we are. But we, we, no, no, just go ahead, just do it. And that's, so we, we ended up using this kind of documentary system very much. And, and we shot like this now, the Pope with Anthony Hopkins and Jonathan Price, <coughs> and they loved it. Because, you know, you don't interfere with them with marks, you just let them go and there's no conscience of marks or of best light or, you know, I'll fix it in post. <laughs> Uh, continue, continuity people suffer a little bit, <laughs> but once they get used to it, they, they go with it, they go with the flow, and they'll tell you, you know, now that you repeat, that bag was in a different position. Okay, let's put the bag in the correct position and let's do it again. And we do, what we do is normally we do the whole sequence, you know, the two and a half page, we do it all. And what happens is, uh, the shot is, the wide shot of an audience watching a lecture, okay? So I'll do the two minutes and there is you speaking. So uh, Fernando wants to do it again because he, doesn't, he didn't like the way the camera was looking. So we change, but I know that he needs a piece of that. So in the second take, what I will do is I, I will whack into this or I will, you know, I'll do a detail. I will give him more stuff because we already have. So we repeat the whole sequence uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll guarantee that he has that moment that he wants, but in the rest of the take, I'll do something different. And that brings me to another point that I like saying and joking is that as a cinematographer, my, my thing is quantity and not quality. <laughs> because I want to give the editor the quantity for him to have the quality. And there is never a truth on set of the right, the best position. You'll, you'll, you'll always discover that afterwards, when you are in the screening room with a shower taken and in the air condition. And I have, and I have an example of that that I, I like to mention very often. I was doing a commercial, um, and the commercial was um, a model, it was a towel commercial, and the model would have to walk through a layer of water that we dumped from a 600 liter tank that would take 45 minutes to refill. So, and then that layer of, of water, I would reflect some neons and some effects, so it was beautiful, you know. And then you would have, the camera was shooting towards that, that surface of, of water, so it looked like neons, but suddenly you, you saw the model coming in through like that. And I was shooting from a distance with a long lens, and 
It was in the early 80s where video assist was appeared. Because before that, you know, only the camera one, cameraman would see what was going on. And at the end of the take, everybody would look at the camera. Was it good? Yeah, it was good. And, you know, big responsibility. But suddenly, video assist came. And you could see on a little monitor in bad, lousy black and white. But you could have an idea of the framing and so on. So we did first take. And we had problems. The hair came. So we solved 45 minutes, fill up the tank. Second take, do it. Do. So we did three, four takes. And in the fourth take, because I was from a long distance and it took her some time to come out, and I think I was tired, it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, I let the camera a little bit low, and she came out cut like that. <laughs> Shit, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we watched it in the monitor. OK, let's do it again. So fill up the tank again. Everybody's irritated. Fill up the, do it. And she comes out. And this time, I, I was careful. I had a mark. So oh, perfect. OK, let's go home. And at those days, you used to develop the film, and then two days afterwards, watch it in, in a big screen. And it was a tradition that the crew would get together to watch dailies in a big screen. So here we go, shower taken, perfume, comfortably dressed, sitting in a beautiful air conditioner screening room. And when the dailies come, and that fourth take comes, everybody goes, ah, oh. that was a take. That was the one they used. And that brings me to another subject is, I'm, I'm a militant atheist, but I, I'm sure that there's nobody more creative than God. <laughs> what I mean by that is, we are, we are very conservative. We are very careta. How do you say careta? <laughs> careta. <laughs> we, yeah, we are, we are boring. We're never so creative of, as. So, um, so do the right thing, but if, if you have time and you have leftover footage, do the wrong thing also. Because the editor might want it, and probably he will. OK. Should with we with the that, city of God or the brats? let's show the brats, because okay. that, that will fit in nicely with the question about acting. Did but, I answer your question about <coughs> this? Yes, that was very illuminating. Yeah. But also in terms of coverage, and let's also bear in mind the quantity over quality <laughs> as well. Um banco supermercado. Pode parar, né, irmão. O bagulho agora é tosco. É isso lá. mesmo, patrão. É tosco. Isso aqui é tosco. Isso aqui é tosco. Isso que eu já te tosco. falei, rapaz. Se tu quer entrar pra vida do crime, primeiro tu tem que ser aviãozinho. Tu quer ser aviãozinho, bucha? Boa, essa já é aviãozinha mal roubada, irmão. Até eu pegar o contexto com os caras, vai demorar muito, né, ladrão? Isso aí. O avião tá certo. Tem que esperar o mais velho morrer pra depois nós assumir. Não vai ser filho ficar esperando né? ninguém morrer, não. Vou fazer igual o Zé Pequeno faz. Vou passar geral. É isso aí, patrão, pra tá falando que é de merda, mulher. Tô passando aí, puta aqui, ó. Porra, 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 Bora, moleque, escolhe. Diz aí. Bora, meu. No pé ou na mão? Na mãozinha, né? <risos> valeu, pequeno, valeu. É isso aí, mano. Aí, filha com fritas. Quero ver se você sabe o conceito agora. Escolhe um dos dois ali, ó. Santo dedo, né? Ué, pequeno, lá, não se mato. Fica na tua YouTube, é com ele mesmo. Bora, filé. Vai, filé. 
Escolhe um aí, mata Bora aí. Bora dois, filha. Bora, mata logo, amigo. Bora, filha, não tô o dia inteiro não, meu irmão. Bora, amigo. Vai, filha, escolhe logo, mata um cara aí, bro. Bora, filha, não tô o dia inteiro não, rapaz. Vambora, filha. Quero ver se você é do conceito agora. Ah, tá chorando, amigo. Vai lá, vai lá. Fica de sono, logo, amigo. Bora, filha, não tem o dia inteiro não, meu irmão. Aê, <risos> Maria! Aê, Maria! Aê, moleque! Entrou no contexto da galera! Demorou, agora, agora tu vai me mandar de toca! Obrigado! Toca! Demorou, filha! Demorou mesmo! Levanta, moleque! Levanta, porra! Vai lá pro seu nível de rato, moleque! Sem mancar, hein! Bora, rapaz! E avisa tuas coleguinhas que aqui na favela do Zé ninguém rouba, não, hein, porra! Vai, moleque! Sem mancar, hein! <risos> <laughs> Hello, uh, can you say something about the uh, uh, working with the with the director? I mean, I guess some directors are I have a um, clearer picture of the style, and so one of the books one of the books that um, that I enjoyed most reading when when I was studying was La Bottega de la Luce, that is a film, that, that is a book with interviews with uh, Italian cinematographers. And uh, Victorio Storaro says in his interview that he used to work simultaneously with Bertolucci and Coppola. Bertolucci would come on set with a viewfinder hanging and he would go and say, we start here with the 40 mil, the actor is there. We traveling here and we end up here. And we give you exactly the move, the lens, everything. On the other side, Coppola would go on set and say, well, the actors are gonna be here, they're gonna say this and that, you do your thing. And he would say, and I wouldn't say that one is more director than the other one, no. Uh, Hitchcock would know even the depth of field that he would want. Um, Tony Scott, which I had the happiness of working with and I admired a lot, he, he brought on sketches drawn with beautiful pens that he had with exactly the lens, the position, everything. On the other hand, Fernando Mereles, we talk and he just put the actor there and I go and show him and I wouldn't say, again, one is more director than the other. So, as, um, well, we adapt to whatever um, attitude or proposal the director has. Uh, hopefully, we can engage as a cinematographer as early as possible and discuss a lot and analyze a lot and read the script a lot and are very conscious. So in City of God, for example, just an example, a friend of Fernando and me went on set and at dinner time he, he said, hey Cesar, uh, are, is it everything okay with Fernando? Why, what do you mean? I don't see you guys talking. And I said, yeah, everything is so good that we don't need to talk. We know exactly, <laughs> because we had talked so much before. We had prepared so much before. So, uh, it depends very much, you know. As I said, Tony Scott would tell Paul Cameron that that light should have a filter and, and, would, and should be two stops under. You know, he knew very much even about light. So it depends. Cinematographers must adapt and understand which way the director wants to go and what he wants to achieve and help him. And, Fill in the gaps. Is there a mic for Daniel? Hey, Susan. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I just, um, when you were saying there about shooting City of God like a documentary, and we just saw a picture of it actually there as well, because I know you shot them quite lightweight Advent cameras, is that correct? Yeah. Um, but there's a picture there, it also used like a VR headset to kind of, uh, it, uh, to like kind of... Uh, VR? Like this one here. 
you know oh, well, the eyepiece. Well, yes. the eyepiece. Yeah, but, yeah. This <coughs> is my way of shooting from a long time now, because um, when I left film school, I I always envied how sound people, and that was uh, we we were studying Marshall McLuhan, and Marshall McLuhan was saying how free the ear was and how conservative the eye was, and you know. So all of this brought me to thinking that sound is always ahead of us in the way it thinks. And sound has this, they capture in a microphone and they monitor, in a, so, you know, you don't have to put your ear to where, you know? And with the camera, unfortunately, you had because the film went together. So when I found that I could monitor separate from what I could capture, I started doing that and it's, you know, I, I, I do it as much as possible all the time because it allows me to, you know, do this and that. And so um, I, I use this tool very much. And I, I yeah, there you go. Yeah, so uh -huh. I was just going to ask, um, obviously, do you enjoy shooting handheld? Like, do you feel like you become sort of part of the scene when you're working? You're saying that when you're working with, like, non-actors, that you're kind of then become part of this? Or not so fair. So how do you like step back or kind of? Uh, no, I it? I I enjoy doing camera a lot, and um, it's something that worries me because I'm getting old. But I have a physio that takes care of me because I want to operate for a long time, because it's what I enjoy most, because it is what I um, protect my cinematography with. You know what I mean? I, with the camera accidentally, I find a better angle and a better reflection and a better, and things that I haven't thought of but I'll find there when I'm operating. I, sometimes when I'm directing, I like to operate as well. And that is something that I discuss with the cinematographer, if he's okay, Maybe I do a second camera or something like that. I just did a, a mini series in in Brazil with with our common friend. He was the cinematographer, our, our common friend Dudu, um, and um, I I engaged with him and and uh, he let me operate B camera very many times. Thank you. Question. Um, you said that you, yeah, you're not really um, uh, a sound guy uh, or you don't really uh, think about those things maybe when you're doing your job. But do you, do you find that your style of working, um, does that affect how people work on like the sound aspect of the, the films that you make? Do you have contact with those people? Yes. Um, Yes, yes, uh, yes. Um, that is that is an issue, and uh, in City of God, for example, we had the sound technician did not adapt to that because he didn't have the rehearsals that he wanted, and so and so, and um, and he he quit the job, and another guy finished it up. Um, it has to be something that has to be talked with and has to be, but from that on, from there on, all the other films that I've done, the sound technician, um, sound mixer, we talk, we prepare, and he gets prepared to that, and it flows very well. But it, it is a way of, you know, he has to be prepared to do a story as if it was a documentary, but guarantee a quality that afterwards can be uh, made to what he likes. But it is, yes, it is a, an issue that has to be thought of. But one thing that, um, a, an experience that I, I had here, when I walked into the, into the suite where I was going to do the color correction of Constant Garner. And I walked into a, 
uh, it was a projection room because I, I had always done color correction in little rooms with a monitor like that. But this was a projection room with a table and I walked in and I said, huh, I'm walking in like if it was an ADR uh, sound <coughs> mixing. So image has reached where the sound has been for 10 years now already. Because um, what I think happens, and because of this post-production thing, I think the more you can transfer to post-production to make the correct decisions, the better. So what happens? Sound is now capturing a sound technically correct that can be worked on afterwards. I think image is going in that direction also. Image, I, I think as the image very much as I'm capturing this that I will reframe afterwards. This film, for example, we shot in 8K because I, you know, I knew afterwards I could reframe and I could change the color and so it's transferring lots of creative decisions to that moment with the shower and the air conditioning. Shall we have another clip before we go to the next question? Maybe one from the Constant Gardener? Uh, yeah. so but may maybe we can make the, the question simultaneous and I can answer while you're watching the clip. Could, could, could you go louder? Is, is there a mic? Style would suit a lot better to shooting a digital, like leaving it rather. Oh, yeah, to me, film is <laughs> buried. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no need, no need. No, oh, today, today with the digital cameras, you have everything, everything that you want and more. The, I, I, I don't see any, any reason to ride a horse if you can have a car, you know, it's <laughs> more comfortable. Do you want to play a clip from Constant Gardener Wells instead? Shall we try that? Sorry? Shall we play a clip Wells instead? Yeah. Let's, okay, experiment. Okay. Experimental Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> and worse, I made him a vile promise that I have absolutely no intention of keeping. Oh, do you come in? Come yeah, please, of course. Yeah. Thank you. You need the way. Go ahead, go <laughs> ahead. Take a look. Right. I really hate to think how it would hurt Justin if he knew. I violated his code, Ham, in the most cynical way. In the end, that justifies my needs. I need this creep to help me blackmail Her Majesty's government. Please tell me I'm not a ruthless bitch. Please tell me that Justin would understand if he knew. If you give me the wrong answer, then I will push you into the Tiber like I did when we were 16. Ciao, my darling. Thank you. What for? For um, this wonderful gift. How very generous of me. No, I... <laughs> yeah, just to put this on.
When they were children, you'd be prosecuted. I do more to them when I remember. You see, all of the saving lives around the world, but you let your poor plants die. I say put people first. <laughs> safe with you. I can you when you were six. You are leading the revolution. I, I, I insist and insist and insist when, when we go on set cameramen should know the script almost by heart as an actor does. To know exactly what's coming, where we're going, what's going on. That's fundamental. We have that scene. We have the American cinematographer scene. Oh. Yeah, here, here. Oh, you found it. Yeah, I found it if you want to go. Yeah, um, remember I was telling you about um, God's influence? Um, <laughs> yeah. There he goes again. I was going to show you that. No, no, leave it. That's fine. So let's see. It's really short. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Take care of yourself, okay? I think you're a bit barker. I'm very tired. I'm sorry. I can't translate that word to you. So you better ask the kind mind. That, that shot of Rachel Wise walking um, by the camera called the attention of um, a lady from the magazine American Cinematographer as one of the scenes that had uh, caught, impressed her more or something. And I told her the story. The story is, uh, remember the quantity thing I was telling about? Um, we had, the, the way we had to film this is uh, because of the slum in Nairobi, we had to park at the place, unload, and walk for 40 minutes. And uh, as I always insist with assistant directors, uh, shooting day is a shooting day. So we should shoot. So if we're walking 40 minutes, why not shoot? Especially today when it's digital. When film, you, you had the problem that you would waste film. But for these walks, I asked, uh, I, you know, everybody was carrying some, something. So instead of me carrying an Apple box, I would carry the camera. And things that I thought, because I knew the script, were useful for the editor, for the quantity, I would shoot. So much of these kids looking at the camera was on these walks that I would just capture that. And one time we're going back and the light had gone, but I'm walking by Rachel Wise and I see that she has a nice emotion. So I just point to the camera and me, myself, I kind of never reached the focus, but I tried <laughs> to reach the focus. And that's the shot. And you know, that's him again. It happened, you know, it wasn't scripted, but I knew the script, and I knew what was necessary, and I knew how important to get images of her emotion were, so. So luckily, the focus pillar wasn't around. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. It might be worth mentioning that in the film, she just lost a child, so she's out of focus, you know, because it doesn't make sense alone. Mm -hmm. Okay, shall we take another question? Uh, where are the mics? We got someone over here. 
And I think we've got two mics. <laughs> I have two. Yeah, me too. We've got loads of mics. And one camera. Mm. Do you think um, Hans spent last um, frame or so from the Castellar now? What's just your, what's your relationship with uh, composition? And um, together... Co composition? Yeah, of the image and framing. And together with this approach and the importance of this technique, minimalistic background, um, the choice to be also so unpredictable in, in the framing, for, for example, like in, in the last one of the Quest of Garden. Where does it come from? It's like... Documentary. 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 It's just... It's just... When, when, I, when I was in film school and I didn't have a chance to rehearse with filming, and I, I had nothing to do. I would grab my stills camera and I would play around, just, just transferring this three-dimension reality into this bi-dimensional force line reality. So, getting you know, getting conscious with the image, and and that I do very much. That's what I say when I go to a location. What, one habit I have, for example, is. We, we go with production to a location. OK, this is the location that we're going to film. So the next visit to the location will be the tech scout where we'll bring the crew. I say, no, let me go first by myself. I, I want to spend an hour there. And I go there and I start playing around and finding, and finding that, you know, just playing around, just relating this, this three-dimensional world to this B-dimensional. You know, and finding and playing around and getting familiar with the place, how it relates to the eye. And this I do all the time by preparing and by playing around. So when, when the scene goes on, and in, for example, in, in blindness, we had, um, we had the A camera was, that was doing the kind of conservative storytelling. Then I was doing a B camera that was, because I already had the story told by the A camera, I would go into this awkward, but that has relation with the story, a reflection or something like that, you know? And in, in blindness, we were lucky because we had a comfortable budget. And I had an Aton Minima with me, a little 16 millimeter camera. So, you know, in order to have more footage, I gave it to him to operate. And what I did was, the scene is going to be here, so I just put it there. And, and suddenly some interesting piece of feet or something would, and lots of scenes in the film are, come from there. Very awkward framing that were, were done by him. But you know, what the habit, for example, is when we're doing one camera, now, for example, in this film with, with Anthony Hopkins and, and Jonathan Price, we would do a first take where I guarantee the actors in the frame. We have it. OK, let's do one more. And we call it freestyle. And then I'll go, you know, a piece of his hair, his hand, and I'll go something that I, I believe and I feel that is related to what the story that I'm telling. There's no point in showing a dog if they're talking about, you know. But suddenly they're talking about tearing out things, and I see a dog. Oh, interesting how. See what I mean? Did it more or less answer? Because it's very, it's very intuition, you know, playing around and, and, and finding. And that's why I insist that the cameraman becomes a co-director when he's filming. He knows so well the story that he's going to offer the director with his framing and with his storytelling something that only he can find, only he can interpret. Teddy, is there, is there a mic on this side of the room? Yep. Yeah, behind, behind you. you. large format lenses 
and whether that takes away some spontaneity because because of the fact that essentially the lenses are getting bigger, the cameras are getting bigger. When you especially when you achieve such beautiful results with Super 16. Well, in 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 this last film, the Pope, we had the the helium red helium. That was really light, really light, and. The advantage is that it is 4K, but Netflix made it a point that I gave them minimum 4K. So originally, I was going to shoot it with, an, uh, with the Arri Alexa that I consider the best sensor that has reached the perfect quality of everything, of skin tone and everything, in, in the first go. But they didn't let me film with that camera for legal question because it was a 3.8K. So we, 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 we moved to this helium. And the helium gave me the advantage that I could use 16 millimeter lenses. So I, I would have a very powerful zoom from 11 to 160 something in, in a half a kilo or one kilo lens. While if I had to have this in a large format, you know, my back would have gone like that. So, um, and I was able to do, at the end, it was lighter than, than a 16 millimeter camera, this camera with this lens. So. Uh, you know, that's fascinating, because you actually assume you're cropping the sensor. Yeah, the, yeah. Which is, which is great, I love that. But yeah, uh, it takes, it also it takes the, 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 harsh, the video harshness away. But there's such a vogue at the moment for making bigger sensors and, and larger lenses that go with them. To me, that seems to be a step backwards. It's almost just, just like manufacturers making. At, at the end, it's us filmmakers that are going to use the tool. So you know, we'll end up putting a stocking or Vaseline or whatever in front to make it, you know, as we did at the beginning. You know, I learned from a, a very famous um, British uh, stills photographer that did these beautiful pictures that had like vapor on them. And what he did is he, he did like that before he took, and it had like a foggy effect. What was his name? Very famous. He did little models. I don't remember, anyway. Um, but you know, I think that the, bet, the, the, the more information we get, the better we can take it away afterwards, you know, in post, so I, I don't mind. In, in, in blindness, for example, because I wanted, it was film, because I wanted the audience to be conscious of a very high definition, I shot 16 mil, 35, and, and um, Vista Vision. That I, afterwards I, I, I put on digital, but you know, I wanted a bigger format to get more definition, so welcome. It's, it's us that will handle it at the end. So tools are there to be messed up and you know, thrown away and do whatever you want. But you shot bits of American made the Tom Cruise movie with a, with a black magic box. Yeah, cinema yeah, cinema and all yeah. yeah because, because, I, because uh, uh, Tom Cruise wanted to pilot himself, and, and he wanted the real thing going on. The only way that I could, you know, be in the cabin with him and move around was, you know, handling, and that is him piloting actually uh, the plane. So we're, we're on the air, yeah. And I was very, very happy when, when, I, when I went to the IMAX cinema to watch the projection and the $900 black magic was giving me such beautiful close-ups and texture and skin tone. It's getting easy, man. <laughs> 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 yeah, but you know what? People say, hey, but don't you mind that now everybody can film because it's so easy? And I say, well, there's, there's been pencils for ages, and not everybody's Shakespeare. I mean. <laughs> Hi. Um, can you talk about when you shot in London, and specifically how you dealt with the flat light here versus where you shot 
in places where the light was a lot more flat dark. light you had, you had nice shadows flat light i i was i was i was walking on russell square sunday and i and i was so envious of you guys i mean fuck what the light is like here come on you have to go to brazil and see what a sun what a, you have to go to brazil and see what a sun doing like that is how it's awful to shoot with <laughs> No, here, I'm, oh, come on, here you're, yeah, it, it, it gets hazy, okay, it's beautiful soft light. You have to adapt and you have to, you know. Good for continuity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I believe City of God was the first film that went through a DI before the final print. And I'm just curious about how that process was because no one had done it before, long form of film. Yes, it was, it was, it was a nightmare. I, I, I was doing psychoanalysis, how do you call it? Shrink. And uh, at least in two sessions I cried <laughs> with my analyst <laughs> because it was, it was a pain. Um, we, we, we were very lucky, very, very lucky, and I, one of the other phrases that I like mention is, City of God wouldn't have been City of God if it wasn't for Palace II. We had the chance, and Palace II, the story is, follows. Fernando was invited to do an episode for Brazilian television, for uh, Brava Gente Brasileira, that is a, a, a series that shows different chapters of Brazilian characters. And TV Globo invited Fernando to do that. And Fernando said, no, I'm very busy now doing, preparing for my feature film that I've put all my energy into it. And Gewa Heis, the, the director of that uh, nucleus of Globo, insisted. And he said, come on, Fernando, do. And Fernando says, oh, OK, if I can shoot uh, as, a, as a rehearsal for my film, if I can shoot um, a, a little short extract from that book that looks like City of God, okay, I'll do it. So Fernando called me and, and told me to do the cinematography of Palace of and I also rejected, I said, oh, come on, Fernando, I'm, I'm busy doing things, we'll only, only be shooting in six months. And Fernando said, but come on, when we come close to film, won't you start wanting to do camera tests and do all these tests that you like doing? He, know, he knew that I, he said, come on, Globo is paying you to do them now. Do them now. So we did Palace Dos as a test. And I consider it the most uh, varied photography that I've ever done because I did, I tried every style. We filmed with four different cameras, with 10 types of negative, in all the ways, with Mark, without Mark. And in that Palace, we learned, everybody learned. Even production learned how to deal with the production issues of Favela. And one of them was with Palace II, we put through the whole process of DI. And we rehearsed it. And um, it was, I, I always remember it as one of, because I was, I was taking a risk of proposing this. Walter Salis, that was a producer of, of the film, had told Fernando, you are crazy. Don't listen to what Cesar is doing you're risking everything. Because I was proposing filming 16 and 35, mixing it all together and putting it to digital and going to a screen. But nobody had done it. But we w used to do it a lot for commercials. But nobody had done it for a film. So it was a risk. So fortunately, we had six months prior, we had this Palace Dos that was a series for TV, but we transferred it to a little short feature. and went all the, the chain, the workflow through. And I remember with pleasure, Saturday morning, I invited Fernando to a screening, to a, to a, thin, to a cinema, a regular cinema. Uh, Seski uh, Augusta has a huge screen projector. And I was so scared. And when it comes on, Fernando watches it. And the other hand said, yeah, let's go. <laughs> so we had tested. But even like that, we had during the process, we had lots of problems with Serginho didn't know all the tools. So at a certain moment, he used a lot of noise reduction. 
And when we transferred it to film, it appeared too much, so we had to redo. So it was, a, it was a painful process, but very gratifying, because after that, you know, ciao film. <laughs> But on top of the DI, you, you were like mixing loads of film stocks and cross-processing and bleach by Yeah, because, because in the telecine, I, I had been doing commercials for a long time, and in commercials you, should do, you would do that. You would film 16 or 35, you would go to digital, do all your coloring, remember my lab maniac? So you would play around, and, and I, I used to do with Fernando lots of commercials, for clothes, say yeah, so, and in those you could go crazy, you know, go put crazy reds, and so I loved that too. So it was very gratifying to be able to. Shall we watch a little sequence from Palace Two? This is the short film that ended up being a camera test for yeah. City of God. Sure. Do we? No yeah. Do we have another <laughs> bit? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Did, is, is decent the one they sent you? Uh, yeah, this oh. is the, the better. There's no subtitles just for first to have a look. I'm gonna just show the break sequence then. Could you turn the light off? tested here and obviously here we overdid it. So in City of God we stepped back. This was, you know, we looked at it, no, that's too much. City of God we stepped back a little bit. So it, it had a lot of, a lot of uh, things that we learned from that. And from that experience on, every time that I'm going to do a film, I try to invent something that we can get the crew together and get something close to what the film is going to look like and do a little testing filming before. Because, you know, you, 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 you get in contact with the subject, you get in contact with the way you're filming, you, you rehearse, you prepare. And then when you go on the real thing, you are more in control of the situation. You know more where you're going. Here, you know, when we had done this six months before, it was four days of shooting, but what, six months afterwards when we came on set, we knew, you know, how to relate to the kids, how to relate to the subject, how we, we because it's, it's so, it's so scaring, you know, the first day of shooting. So with this, you take away that scaring of the first day because you have already done the first day on those days that are just to throw away. Okay, next question. Behind. Um, so, just a quick question. You mentioned the harshness of the... Of the, the, the harshness of yeah. the digital look, and I was just wondering how would you deal with it other than the big glass you mentioned Un? also. Other than the vintage glass you mentioned also. Yeah. You mean when you can't afford vintage glass? <laughs> um, I, I, I didn't even think of the word vintage. I, I, um, I thought of uh, 16 millimeter lenses as being much cheaper and much more available because, you know, there's hundreds of 16 millimeter cameras that are not being used anymore. So you, you'll find, you know, loads of them around, so, uh, but also there are, if, you know, if you have to shoot with a lens that is too harsh, you, you have tools in post-production that you can use very easily, you know. Um, in this film, The Pope, that we're doing, we, we have a lot of, um, period things like flashbacks and some of them we want them to look as stock footage that we bought 
And some of them we are matching with footage that we bought. And in post-production, we're adding filters and adding uh, textures and, and making them look as vintage as. So the, the power that you have today in, in post-production and the cheap power that you have today. You know, if, you know how, I, how I start coloring my films? On my cell phone with Instagram tools. I'm on set and I have lit something, so I start taking pictures and while the director is rehearsing, I'll start playing around with those um, random filters and suddenly God sends me, ooh, look at that, that's great, I hadn't thought of that. I send it by WhatsApp to the colorist and he downloads it and he does dailies more in that direction. And it's amazing the amount of tools and, and facilities that you have today, so. So would you approach lighting differently in a way of using diffusion? Or yes, yes. Um, today, again, there is much of the lighting that you can do afterwards in post-production. And I joke that uh, Storara would say painting with light and I would say painting with mouse. Because <laughs> there is very much that you can do in post-production. But you have to know what you can do so you can, like I said, sound, you know, that you can give a technically correct image that you will work on afterwards. So, for example, the, the contrast of the lighting that you, you should kind of control on set, you know, because then it's, it's difficult if you like a certain contrast of the image to make a shadow darker, then you will affect the, you also can. Like for example, in this film, we had to do a pickup of a dialogue of Tony Scott with, with Jonathan that, they, that we had done in a garden and I didn't have time to look up the dailies so I, I, I did a lighting on set with green screen that was a little bit more contrasty than what I had. I remember that I had a sun so I, I, re, I imagined that the, I had a two stop difference so I lit like that but when the dailies came up the shadow was very dark. So now in the color suite what we did is we masked the shadow and brought it up a little bit. Constant Garner, for example, um, Ray Fiennes has very deep eyes and it's very difficult to light when you think of this 360 light because the 360 light, what you do is put lots of top lights. But he would need like a front light. But if I wanted him moving around freely, I wasn't able to put front lights because that light would be on the set or would be visible. So what I did, I shot it that way because I knew, I had tested, that afterwards in post-production, and you discovered that the shot that you overexpose br brought back to natural has better texture. Okay. So then you establish that the, sen the, the sensibility of that film is you, but one stop overexposed. So it's not 250, it's 125. So we saw two distinct looks in the Constant Gardener in that sequence, mm -hmm. one for the present, one for the past. So had you arrived at that, those precise looks Definitely with completely him, yeah. in Much, advance? Yeah, yeah. We had worked on that. As I said, what I did at that period, I would carry on my camera uh, little bobinas, spools of the same negative that I would be using afterwards. I had chosen already, okay, this is the 250 ASA film that I'm going to use. Okay, so I would, the, the production company would give me a read, I would uh, rewind into these little spools, I would load my still camera with that and take pictures in the location. And take pictures of, okay, I don't have Rachel Wise, but I have a assistant production, a producer that is white skinned and oh, can you stand there and let me so I I got these pictures and I took them over and with Asa we would sit down and play around and do like these references so when I was filming I know and before that 
I had uh, a little CD room at that period um, that had 250 pictures, like three or four for each sequence, and I spread that around the crew, like the makeup person would have, so she would know what it would look like. You know, when this scene, when he's crying, it's gonna be bluish and washed out, so the makeup person already knows that. So I, I gave around those CDs to people and the colorist that was not Asa because Asa was the senior colorist but the dailies was another guy. He had the CD, so he received the sequence, sequence 25, he would go into the CD room, ah, these three pictures. So this is the look that I have to emulate. Yeah, so just to clarify that even though you can do so much in post, you don't leave it until post. We were going 40% to... before, 40%. This 40% before means rehearsing, preparing what you're going to do afterwards. Uh, rehearsing, you know, for example, City of God. An example that I, like, that I like to mention. City of God. I had a night scene. The kids are on top of a tree and they're at night. Uh, yeah, we got that one. They're, they're at night and... Uh, so how am I going to, am I going to, am I going to light it? How does a, a, a forest in, in, inside uh, in the neighborhood of Rio de Janeiro look like? And the typical that you've probably seen was those HMI rays like that, kind of Michael Jackson video clip, you know. I, I wanted something more natural, so I walked into a, a little forest and looked at the light, and I said, ah, oh, this is like a soft, very soft, bluish dark light. Ah, okay, how do I achieve this? Ah, if I shoot during the day, in an overcast day, I'll get this feeling. Then I, in post-production, I underexpose and make it bluish. Ah, okay, but then something, something that helped me more came up. I said, ah, a forest is green and the skins, the skins are reddish. These are uh, opposite colors. So if I can tell the machine that green is black and red is white, I can separate uh, luminancia with chrominancia, luminance with chrominance. So I did a test with that, send it to, Regi to Serginho in Sao Paulo. Serginho, can we separate the green, uh, make it a, a light channel, take to black? And, oh, it works. And he said, yeah, but if you could make the skins a little bit redder, it would be better. Ah, okay, makeup artists, can we paint the guys in red? Oh yeah, of course. In Brazil, we have this uh, ink that the Indians use called urucum, that is reddish. So if you, you, if, if you were to walk on the set of, on that scene, you would, what's going on? Because <laughs> the guys were painted like Indians. But that gave the information to the, post-production that afterwards we could get the red and light it and the green and darken it. So that is a combination of pre-production with post-production. It's leaving it to post, but knowing it before what you're gonna do. Okay, so let's look at an example of that in the forest. Yeah. See that the wood also st stands up. But the guys that are dark stand up more. For example, uh, Constant Gardner. Um, Fernando uh, wanted a scene of, of Ray Fiennes coming back to London and seeing London after he had had this sad moment. So um, 
we, we wanted a scene of him in the car, but we were in a rush. So while he was preparing something, I just grabbed production, uh, gave me a car, and I went with him in the car, uh, just me and him, me sitting in, in like the, the seat that points toward him. And by my framing, I was taking care of that he would be in a way that in, in post I could frame or, or mask him in order to make the exterior that was like three or four stops over that I could bring it down. So I could do like a little power window, uh, you know, protect like this is him and here's the window. So I, I shot it, you know, I didn't move the camera very much because that would be a, a headache. So I let it more or less stable so I could do this on him and separate this part and make it darker to compensate. Today you have cameras with HDR, so that is also not a problem anymore. It's getting easier. <laughs> it's getting so easy. Okay, we're kind of running out of time, so there was someone wanted to ask a question over oh, here, yeah. and then we'll um, have a final question. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, do you have a favorite film in the means of cinematography, or a film that you consider to be a good example of cinematography? Personally, you. I, I, I like cinematographers like Victorio Storaro, um, um, what's his name, British, uh, just won the Oscar, I'm very bad at remembering names. Deakins. Deakins, Roger Deakins. There, oh, there's so many. Every, every time there's new, um, new guys appearing with beautiful stuff. I don't have favorite, no. Will you be around for BSC Expo? For? BS, it's first and second of Feb, I think. I will, yeah. yeah it's in yeah. Battersea Park. Roger oh. Deakins is making an appearance there. Oh, great. <laughs> OK, so we, final question. Hello. Um, you said your background is in photography, and you do quite a lot of tests. Um, is there a reason why in, in cinematography or in motion picture people don't use tilt shift lenses the way they do use uh, tilt shift lenses the way you, they do in photography to swing the um, the plane of focus? They're kind of like large format cameras. We used to use them very much in commercials, but I think when you're when you're telling a story, it's it's kind of difficult to go around, but. You might use them for specific shots. I mean, all the tools are, are welcome if, if they help tell the story, if they, if they have a, pur a purpose for it. You know, so I remember, I remember once that I needed like a <clears throat> very out of focus effect that I hold the lens on my hand and just it was out of the turret. So I hold it and then I took it away in order to make a out of focus thing. I think in, in, in this scene in, in that we saw in, in, in blindness, when they goes really out of focus, we were doing something like that. So yeah, it, you, you, you welcome all the tools that you have and, and find a use for them, you know? OK, so we're pretty much out of time now. So thanks very much, Suzanne, Thank for you. coming into Goldsmiths. Um, sharing your extensive knowledge with us. And thank you to Laura as well. Yeah.